as long as we have laws that govern the relationship between the employer and the uh, members of the union, we must constantly be on the alert to protect those rights, the right of freedom to speech, freedom of assembly, the right to peacefully picket. And uh, there's one adage we should always remember, those who forget the past are destined to relive it. steel strike and the Memorial Day Massacre forever altered the public's eye on police brutality, basic First Amendment rights, and how much they are supported in court. The Memorial Day Massacre was part of the Little Steel Strike, a movement for steel workers' rights. The Steel Workers' Organizing Committee, or the SWOC, of the Congress of Industrial Organizations, or the CIO, had the main focus of getting rights for steel workers nationwide. The CIO was a group broken off from the American Federation of Labor, another group devoted to workers' rights. The CIO was hoping to have a contract signed by the major steel organizations and smaller steel mills of America. This contract would give the union recognition and would set out a basic wage deal for workers. Eventually, U.S. Steel, a major steel company, agreed to sign the contract and give the SWOC recognition. But while U.S. Steel decided to sign, many other organizations were much less willing. Many smaller mills, including Republic Steel, located on the south side of Chicago, refused to sign. Because of this, various protests and marches arose around Republic Steel. One of those marches was on May 29, 1937, two days before the massacre. When it was stopped by clubs, by police, a new march in protest of those injured was planned. It was to take place on Memorial Day. Before the march, a rally was planned to take place at Sam's Place, the SWOC's headquarters in the area for the time being. Families arrived from all over Chicago to take part. Families came with picnic baskets, women sang songs of joy, toddlers played together, and speeches of hope were made at the rally. Those who were there at the time describe it as a celebration of the workers' strength. The rally lasted for hours, and when it came time to march across the prairie that had to be crossed to get to Republic Steel, the protesters had smiles on their faces and hope in their hearts. But it was not to last. When the marchers approached the gates of Republic Steel, they were completely astounded to see a row of Chicago police, armed with clubs, guns, and cold faces, blocking their path. Front row of marchers, angry with the blockade, began to argue with the police for their right to peacefully proceed. But what was to follow would be anything but peaceful. Guns were fired, clubs were drawn, and tear grass was thrown. All the marchers could do was run. The police began to open fire on the fleeing marchers, while those unfortunate enough to be caught by the police were brutally beaten with clubs until they either escaped or were taken to jail. Molly West, the leader of the Singing at Sam's Place, describes what happened when she was knocked over by her fellow marchers trying to flee. And there was the one time in my life that I saw a battlefield. And as I was standing there absolutely bewildered, looking around, I felt something in the back. And was a policeman who stepped, shoved the gun on my back and said, get off of the field or I'll put a bullet through your back. While Molly was lucky enough to escape physically unharmed, Many were thrown into carts called paddy wagons, meant to carry people who were arrested to jail. The paddy wagons were filled with twice as many people as normal, leaving those inside cramped. The wounded who were thrown into the wagons were unable to make it to a hospital until hours after the march. Of the ten killed that day, two were shot at the beginning before they could turn to run, seven were shot in the back while they were trying to flee, and one was left to bleed to death while the officers stared. Sixty more people suffered from injuries inflicted by clubs, and thirty suffered injuries from bullet wounds. After the massacre, court trials were arranged, and major changes were soon to occur for the advancement of the Little Steel strike. Police officials denied police brutality claims, and blamed the incident on communists and radicals. The police claimed that the march was well orchestrated, while the SWOC denied and claimed it was arose from spontaneous anger for the march shut down only two days before. The SWOC turned to who they hoped would help them with their case, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. 
After helping him with his 1936 election by giving him approval and support, the SWOC was hopeful that Roosevelt would speak up in favor of their defense, but he turned them down publicly and refused to commend the murders or intervene on the SWOC's side. In the end, the police left the trials with no charges against them. Later video footage was found, the same video footage seen earlier in the video. The police withheld the footage from the public's eye, but one man who was allowed to see it at the time described the police beating the marchers in a business-like manner. Shortly after the massacre, the strike ended, and the union ultimately won its contract with the smaller mills. While the police were able to avoid charges at first, a congressional investigation later acknowledged the police for using extensive force. There may have been some official recognition towards the police for their brutality, but it did not excuse them or give back the rights taken away from the marchers on that day. In an article by Tom Ellie, Ellie states what he believes to be the main lesson of the massacre. The most crucial lesson of this event is the paramount importance of politics, perspective, and leadership in the struggle for the emancipation of the working class. When the police stopped those marchers on Memorial Day, they took away their First Amendment right to peacefully assemble. Not only were their rights taken away, but when they pleaded in court for the police to be recognized for brutality, they were turned away. The public outcry eventually gained the rights back, with charges against the police filed, but it still did not change what happened that day. While the event itself was horrible, the overall end of it helped the movement for labor rights across America, and showed a success story for those affected by police brutality. The actions that occurred on Memorial Day in 1937 have forever left their mark on both the issues of police brutality and the enforcement of First Amendment rights.